Mount Wilson is one of the peaks overlooking the city of Los Angeles. It's 5,700 feet high, nothing special, and uh, outwardly there's nothing to mark it out. But in fact, Mount Wilson is a very special peak indeed. On top of it is what was, for many years, the largest astronomical telescope in the world, the 100-inch Hooker Reflector, which is still one of the leaders in its field. In fact, Mount Wilson Observatory didn't start with a large optical telescope at all. It was the brainchild of a brilliant young American, George Ellery Hale. He was particularly interested in the sun, and in 1892, he invented a, a new instrument called the spectroheliscope, which allows you to study the sun in the light of one element only, usually hydrogen or calcium. And he then turned his attention to the design of a new sort of solar telescope. The telescope's known as the Snow Telescope, because it was financed by Miss Snow, or if you like, as the Horizontal Telescope. The sun's light is caught by a 36-inch mirror, which is equatorially mounted and can track the sun. The light then sends onto a flat mirror, which directs the sunlight in a fixed direction down the horizontal tunnel onto the primary mirror, which focuses the light onto a second flat and then sends it down into the recording devices. And the advantage of this is, of course, that the heavy recording equipment doesn't have to be removed at all. The total focal length is 60 feet. The Snow Telescope worked well, and in fact it still works very well indeed. But it is a horizontal telescope, and to some extent it's affected by the heating of the ground. The remedy for that is to put your coelostat high in the air and build a vertical or tower telescope. And there are two of these in Mount Wilson, one with a focal length of 60 feet and the other with a focal length of no less than 150 feet. It was in 1908, using the 60-foot tower and this spectroheliograph, that Hale discovered the magnetic fields in sunspots. The importance of that discovery in solar physics simply can't be overestimated. But, of course, sunspots are not always present. Every 11 years, they're plentiful, and then activity dies down before building up again to the next maximum. The last maximum occurred in 1980, so we expect the next round about 1991, though the cycle isn't perfectly regular and we can't be sure. In fact, during the last few years, it's become clear that our knowledge of the sun is very far from complete. And one astronomer who knows this very well is Dr. Robert Howard. Dr. Howard, you're using the 150-foot tower telescope. What form is your research taking? Well, my research now is, uh, in, involves mostly large-scale properties of the sun. For example, the magnetic fields, the large-scale distribution of the fields, the fields are, are observed here with the 150-foot tower telescope and also velocity fields. We, uh, we investigate the uh, rotation of the sun, for example, large-scale fields, currents on the surface of the sun that are related to circulation on a large scale within the sun. And of course, there's not very much of an overall magnetic field to the sun, is there? The overall magnetic field of the sun is very weak. It's comparable to that of the Earth, for example. Uh, a very, very weak field uh, uh, on the large scale in the sun. However, there are spots in the sun, there are regions of the sun where fields are very, very strong. In particular, for example, in sunspots. Uh, what does this tell you about the sun's interior? Well, it tells us that there are magnetic fields in the interior because we see them emerge at the surface. Uh, you see, we, obviously we cannot see the interior of the sun. This is one of the great mysteries of the sun right now, exactly what the structure of the interior is, exactly how the, uh, the uh, interior processes affect the surface of the sun, how they affect the energy coming out, and, and how they affect uh, the, the uh, solar activity that we see in the solar system. Would you say now that the origin of the sunspots themselves have been definitely solved? Oh, absolutely not. The origin of the sunspots is one of the, one of the mysteries of the sun right now. We, we don't know uh, why the sunspots are there. For example, if, if we did not see sunspots, we would not, as solar astronomers, would not be saying, uh, why, why do we not see sunspots? We don't know why we see sunspots. The sunspots are regions where the magnetic field is very, very strong. That's known. That was discovered here at Mount Wilson many, many years ago, decades ago. But uh, we do not know what causes a sunspot. We've heard a great deal recently about solar waves and solar shaking. What is the latest news on that? Well, that's a very exciting subject. I think that's, uh, that's a topic that, uh, that will, be, uh, will give us very interesting results in, in the years ahead. We're, we're preparing now to observe that here at Mount Wilson, as a matter of fact. What form will these observations take? The observations are uh, of the absorption line profiles. They're, they're the, the spectrum lines of the sun as they wiggle back and forth, as the motions affect the, the formation of, the, of these uh, line profiles. And, and this is a motion, it's a, a wave motion at the solar surface, 
which uh, is a, a very deep-seated wave motion. It's, uh, it's a wave that, that, uh, that uh, travels far into the sun and far out again to, to, to the surface. And if we examine very carefully the nature of the wave patterns on the solar surface, we can, we can uh, determine a great deal about the interior structure, the interior dynamics of the sun. It's a very exciting, uh, really our first opportunity to look, in a sense, into the interior of the sun. There's been talk, hasn't there, that the, the rotation of the inner part of the sun may not be the same as the outer part. That's right. That's the topic of some uh, uh, discussion right now. Some people feel that the interior of the sun may be rotating rather rapidly, ra rather uh, quite a bit more rapidly than the surface of the sun. Some people feel that this is not the case. And this is something that I think may be determined in the next uh, five or ten years by this sort of seismological observing of, of the oscillations. I've also heard suggestions that the sun may change in size, very slightly but perceptibly, over a period of a few centuries. What do you think about that? Well, that's a, that's a very intriguing thought. Uh, I think that uh, uh, a number of people, including uh, the group here at Mount Wilson, is, uh, are, are going back to look at, uh, at past records. And some of this has already been published. Some people find that uh, the, the sun is very, very slowly shrinking. And uh, some people find no, no change at all. It depends upon uh, what sort of observations you look at. So it's, it's, a, it's a topic that is still very much up in the air. What do you think yourself? Uh, I don't think it's changing. In other words, the old observations are not sufficiently accurate. That's right. And what then about a possible long-term changes in the sun that you might observe? Do you think there are going to be any? Uh, well, certainly, uh, if you look at long enough term, there certainly are changes. The, the sun is a, an evolving star. We know how stars evolve. Uh, it should be getting slightly brighter and somewhat, somewhat larger, in fact, not smaller. But uh, this is a, a change over millions of years, of course, not over, not over a few years. Uh, over periods of time that we can see, I think there, there may be some chance of finding perhaps some slight variations in the radius due to uh, very long-term oscillations or due to, to uh, uh, the kind of things that, that happen on the uh, interior of, of, of the stars, of, of the sun, that, uh, that uh, we are just beginning to find out about from such investigations. So the solar telescopes at Mount Wilson are still in full and continuous operation. But Hale didn't confine his attentions to the sun. He needed a large conventional telescope as well. At that stage, refractors were being superseded by reflectors. And so Hale planned a reflector more powerful than any built before, a reflector with a mirror 60 inches in diameter. But where to place it? There were two obvious sites, Mount Wilson and Mount Palomar. Actually, Palomar was the better of the two because it was further away from Los Angeles. But in those days, 1908, it was very difficult indeed to get at. And so Mount Wilson was chosen. Well, the 60-inch looks much the same now as it did then. The tube is a skeleton, the mirror weighs nearly two tons, and the mounting is a massive yoke, and that gives access to the sky through a slit in the main dome, and the dome is nearly 60 feet high. The telescope can be used at the Cassie grain focus. That's to say the incoming light goes down the skeleton tube, hits the main mirror, up onto the secondary mirror, and then back to the observer through a hole in the main mirror. That's one system. Another is the coude, where a second mirror is used to direct the incoming light in a constant direction. And that means that very heavy recording equipment doesn't have to be moved at all. For many purposes, the 60-inch is ideal. Doug Duncan's been using it for his studies of stellar cycles of activity. I've been concentrating on studying stars that are similar to the sun, stars that are about the same size, the same temperature as the sun, We've been finding that they're remarkable in their similarity to what the sun looks like. For instance, you may know that the sun has spots on its surface that come and go with a period of about 11 years. Remarkably, many other stars show this same cycle. Uh, we can also see the effects of uh, stars turning on their axes. The same way the sun turns in about a month's time, we found stars that rotate anywhere from a, a week's period to several months, but quite similar to the sun. But of course, you can't see a visible disk. A star appears only as a point of light. No, we certainly can't. So one has to be rather clever in order to determine this rotation. We look at the spectrum of the star. We look at different features in that spectrum coming and going. And that's how we discover this periodicity. We find that some of the stars are remarkable. They have activity many, many times stronger than the sun's, perhaps 30 times stronger. And uh, it would be quite remarkable uh, if the sun were ever that lively. We'd certainly notice the effects here, but we don't think that's liable to be the case. It seems that all the active stars are the young stars. And as stars age, uh, perhaps a bit like people, they get a bit more quiescent 
They're not quite the same way they were when they were very young. The 60-inch reflector was a success. But already, Hale was planning something even more ambitious, a reflector with a mirror no less than 100 inches in diameter. To house a telescope of that size required a vast dome. Remember, it was to be much larger than any previous instrument. The planning of such a telescope created many problems, not the least of which was money. Hale went to John D. Hooker, a Los Angeles businessman. Hooker agreed to pay for a four and a half ton glass disc, which was duly cast in France. The next millionaire was Andrew Carnegie. He agreed to pay for the mounting of the dome and also for the grinding of the huge disc. That was carried out by the leader in the field, George Ritchie. The grinding took six years, but at last, on the 2nd of November 1917, the telescope was ready to be turned towards the skies. And yet, that first trial must have been heartbreaking. Hale and Ritchie looked at Jupiter. All they saw was a blurred, shimmering disk, devoid of any detail. One could well imagine their feelings. Later, in the early hours of the morning, Hale tried again. This time he looked at the star Betelgeuse in Orion, and all was well. The star was a sharp point. The mirror had had time to cool down after the daytime heat and assume its correct shape. The hooker reflector was a success, after all. Unlike the 60-inch, the mounting is of the English type. That's to say, it's slung between two massive pillars, the only disadvantage being that it can't reach the celestial pole. The drive is by falling weights. That was installed in 1917, and has proved to be so good that there's never been any need to change it. The mirror is made of glass, and there's no hole in the middle, and so the Cassegrain system works in a rather different way. What happens is that the incoming light strikes the main mirror, is then sent back up the skeleton tube onto the secondary mirror, and then back onto another mirror, which directs the light into the side of the tube. The other main optical system is the coude. And here, a system of mirrors directs the light in a fixed direction through a hole in the polar axis into the coude room below, where there's a powerful spectrograph. Bear in mind that in 1917, this was not only the world's largest telescope, it was in a class of its own. It could collect three times as much light as its nearest rival, the 60-inch, also on Mount Wilson. And within a few years, it had been used to make a discovery which ranked as the most important in astronomy since the time of Galileo. Of course, photographs of the moon or planets were taken. But the power of the telescope lay in its immense light grasp. And that meant that it could be used to make detailed studies of objects far beyond the solar system. And in particular, it was used to look for certain special stars in the objects then known as spiral nebulae. Most stars shine steadily for year after year, century after century. But there are some which don't. These are the variable stars. And in particular, there are some variables known as Cepheids, which have periods of variation from a few days to a few weeks. And that was regular as clockwork. It had been found that the period of a Cepheid is a link to its real luminosity. The longer the period, the more luminous the star. Thus, if you have a Cepheid with a period of seven days, it will be more luminous than a Cepheid with a period of only five days. And once you know how bright a star really is, and also how bright it looks, then you can find out its distance. And distance was one of the problems facing astronomers trying to understand these so-called spiral nebulae. Using the 100-inch reflector, Edwin Hubble solved the problem. He found Cepheids in the spirals. He measured their periods, he worked out their distances, and at once he realized that they couldn't possibly be members of our own galaxy. They were too far away. He gave the distance of the Andromeda spiral, Messier 31, as 900,000 light years, uh, later modified to 750,000 light years. We now know that that was considerably too small, but the fundamental breakthrough had been made. Next, by using the 100 inch to study the spectra of the galaxies, Hubble showed that beyond our local group, all the galaxies are racing away from us. For the first time, the universe was shown to be expanding. Without the 100 inch, that discovery could not have been made. No other telescope in the world was nearly powerful enough. You see now what I meant when I said that this telescope revolutionized all our ideas about the universe. Today, modern electronic devices are used with the 100 inch and have extended its range enormously. Dr. Olin Wilson has been working on Mount Wilson ever since 1931, 
and certainly nobody knows the hooker reflector better than he does. And Dr. Wilson, the 100 inch is now being used for work on stellar cycles and rotations. Well, I have not been doing the stellar rotation. I've been doing stellar cycles, analogous to the cycle in the sun. Uh, people who have uh, taken up the work uh, after me have also used the same basic method to get rotation. So we now have the possibility of getting what uh, we used to know only for one star, namely the, the character of the cycle and the rotation period for a lot of stars. And for this kind of work, the 100 inch reflector is particularly suitable. It's excellent for this kind of work. In fact, uh, even the 60 inch is very good for this kind of work because uh, the equipment that has been built and put on the 60 inch is now doing what I used to do on the 100 inch and doing it very well. We hear a great deal about the increase in light pollution in the sky over Mount Wilson now. Is that really becoming a problem? Well, it became a problem a good many years ago, actually. And uh, particularly for direct photography, where you're <coughs> photographing a field of nebulae or whatever in the sky, uh, there is no substitute that I know of yet for the photographic plate. Well, the photographic plate records everything it sees, and if it sees a bright background, it records that also. So for that sort of thing, Mount Wilson is not as good as it once was, certainly not as good as it was near, the, near its beginning. Now, other kinds of work, for example, there are devices now which can, uh, uh, use, used with a spectrograph, you have your object, <coughs> say, in the center of a slit, and the two sides of the slit can be used to electronically uh, subtract off the background, you see, leaving your spectrum un, uh, unaffected by it. That sort of thing can be carried uh, on at Mount Wilson, not as far as you can in a really dark sky, but certainly it would be very useful for many fairly faint things. In other words, even though the sky is not so good as it was, and even though the 100-inch telescope is no longer the world's largest, Mount Wilson Observatory still has a great future. I certainly hope so. It all boils down to a matter of unfortunately, finances, uh, as so many things today. But as far as the mountain itself and the telescopic equipment there, if it were properly supported and used for those things for which it is most capable, it could turn out an enormous amount of very useful work. The 100 inch is no longer the world's largest telescope. The Palomar reflector is twice the size. And yet the Hooker reflector remains in the first rank. It's still used on every possible occasion. It's still producing work of fundamental importance. And you know, it's a very special telescope. Remember, it was in this dome that astronomers first discovered that we live in an expanding universe. <laughs>